are listening to the Sea Realm Podcast and watching. I'm your host, KMO, and I'm joined by John Michael Greer, a longtime friend of the Sea Realm. John Michael Greer, it is good to see you again. It's good to be seen again. You know, you wrote a blog post a couple weeks back that uh, inspired both Kevin and me, and I think uh, inspired a lot of uh, impassioned reaction, perhaps. It certainly inspired a lot of trolls. It included the word eco-fascist. What is an eco-fascist? That's a heck of a good question. <laughs> um, what we know at this point is that um, a very large number of, of, of outlets on the mainstream media have suddenly started talking about eco-fascism. They're making a lot of noise about it. They're doing articles that look remarkably as though they're working off of a set of bullet points and warning about the horrible threat of eco-fascism and how all these white supremacists are actually eco-fascists and you need to be careful about your environmental beliefs because you too might be an eco-fascist. Is there an actual eco-fascist in the world? Oh yeah. What um, is an eco-fascist? Okay, then actual eco-fascist, basically in the, in the realm of fascism, which is one of the fringiest of fringe um, political options these days. You have a few people who mix in an interest in environmental conservation with their interest in authoritarian politics and racism. Okay? That does happen, just as you have some Satanists who play volleyball. Okay? Um, this does not make vo volleyball satanic, although if you wanted to whip up a frenzy about the evils of volleyball, that might be a way to do it. But we are talking the f a fringe of a fringe of a fringe here. A tiny little movement. Um, a couple of the recent gunmen in mass shooting incidents either are or are claimed to be, there's some question as to which, quote, eco-fascists. So one had a manifesto that... Uh, there, was a, there was a manifesto posted to one of the chans. Yeah, attributed um, to the guy. Attributed to the guy. I, I'm still waiting to hear whether they've actually got um, conclusive evidence that he posted it. Um, you know, the chans are full of all kinds of strange things. And it's also full of, they're also full of people who are perfectly willing to try to co-opt um, anything for their own purpose. There's probably some sliver of the audience that needs to spelled out for them. What, what are the chans? Okay, the chans are a set of, a set of websites. Mm -hmm. They are anonymous message boards with absolutely no moderation, absolutely no standards. You can say anything and so people do. <laughs> And on the, um, the sub-forums of the chans, or slash poll for politics, you generally have a lot of extreme right-wing politics, a lot of extreme whack-job politics, and just you name it. If it's unacceptable in, in a you know, polite society these days, you will find it there. I've heard tell that Donald Trump is the 4chan president. Well, in a certain sense, certainly some of the ch people on the chans were very heavily in favor of him. Um, they, there was a lot of noise made in that, um, in that end of things. And, but the thing is, they don't comprise that large of a portion of the electorate, so clearly somebody else voted for him also. <laughs> so back to eco-fascists. Back to eco-fascists. Eco-fascists. There are some eco-fascists in the world. There are some eco-fascists. There might be as many as a few dozen of them. Probably far fewer than there are, say, flat earth aficionados. Oh, y y I mean, yeah, serious. The, f the flat earth society or the, the people who consider um, Elvis Presley an actual god <laughs> outnumber them by probably an order of magnitude, maybe more. So if there are so few actual eco-fascists, what's the use of having a, a threat of eco-fascism Oh, well, threats, prominent. Are, threats are so useful. Mm -hmm. To Especially, whom and why, though? Well, let's, let's, let's get, you know, threats are useful if you want to whip up if you want to distract attention or if you want to get people not thinking, okay, you have an eco-fascist. You could call him an oogie boogie man, okay, <laughs> as long as it got the same emotional effect. Now, the, in my post, I argued that there was actually something going on here that explains the whole business about the evil eco-fascists. Um, up until recently, pe the people who were supporting environmental causes and who were, say, very well off, were not being called on the lack of attention to their own carbon footprints. So you could have situations where people would um, say, as happened recently, of course, you have 300 very rich people going to an environmental conference in Sicily, uh, getting them there involved 114 chartered jets. And that's not even counting the mega yachts, okay? 
the carbon footprint of this one conference probably exceeded the annual carbon footprint of a good many third world cities. It was, I mean, each attendee had a Lamborghini set aside in case they might want to drive around Sicily a little bit. It was that kind of thing. Now, two years ago, five years ago, nobody talked about that. Nobody pointed fingers and said, okay, what about your lifestyle? When the claim was made that, well, people need to cut back on their carbon use. And what has changed is that in the last year, that's no longer the case. When this event in Sicily took place under the auspices of Google, um, all of a sudden, all over a range of media, social media, but also um, the right word into the mainstream media, people were saying, why should we be ready to cut our carbon footprints when you so obviously aren't cutting yours? And it's been picked up and run with. When um, Prince Harry, for example, the what is whatever he is in line to the English English throne, uh, Charles' son, Charles II's son, um, talking impassionately about the need to cut our carbon footprints, and then he and his wife were jetting in their private jet here and there and the other place for all these vacations. And all of a sudden, people are talking about that. So is this do as I say, not as I do? Or what's going on? It's the same thing that happened with, um, with Al Gore's vast air-conditioned mansion and his frequent flyer miles. It's become a major embarrassment at this point. And so what I see going on here is the first stages of an attempt by a lot of people who have kind of um, staked a claim to a certain kind of celebrity environmentalism to back away from that entire subject, to walk back their environmental things because they don't want anything to do with the evil eco-fascists. Now, is that speculative? You bet. I do a lot of speculation on my blog, and I state it as such. But we do live in a time when a lot of news is managed. A lot of news is the management of appearances rather than the presentation of information. And so I posted this, this discussion of ecofascism and of the, um, my suspicion that it had to do with people trying to walk back their environmental commitments so they could continue living lifestyles of absurd extravagance and, and ecological damage um, to see what would happen and to ha get people going, okay, let's watch. So what happens over the next few years what happens as um, the situation continues and various environmental types, especially the celebrity types, continue to be called on their behavior. If in fact we watch them back away from environmentalism completely, environmentalism completely, let's try that again, um, and use ecofascism as the excuse, I think we'll all know what's going on. And if they don't, well, you know, then I'm wrong. That's also a possibility. All of the Democratic candidates for president right now are at least talking about or releasing plans on how they plan to deal with climate change. I'm sure they are. And the effects of climate change. Uh -huh. It seems a tall order to uh, try to manage the global conversation to uh, make anybody who's talking about ecology or carbon footprints mm -hmm. or you know, sustainability mm -hmm. to cast them as a fascist. I mean, that seems like a really tall order. Oh, the thing is, you start, you start by introducing the term and go from there. Have you heard that there will be no debate about um, climate change in the next Democratic candidates debate? That, that topic is off That off topic limits? has been ruled off according to recent media reports. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, we'll see what happens from here. It is entirely possible that I'm wrong, as I said, mm -hmm. but Watching the way that celebrity environmentalists have flustered and fumbled and um, gotten angry and brought in all their celebrity friends to insist, no, 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 how could you be so mean to these people, and all that kind of nonsense. In response to the criticisms of, of the absurd degree of extravagance and, and of, of wastefulness, that's a normal part of the life of a celebrity these days. So... Eco-fascists. Eco-fascists. There are some eco-fascists. There are some eco-fascists. Most people who are concerned about the state of the environment are not fascists. No, the thing <laughs> is, the, the term fascist has been so dramatically distorted. What, what's the proper meaning of the word? Okay, um, the proper meaning, that, that's, that's a heck of a question. Um, it, was invent, it, it emerged, as I understand, in Italy around 1898 
when um, an agrar a bunch of agrarian activists organized uh, basically um, bully squads to deal with the power of the landlords in southern Italy, and they called the, these groups fasci, groups. Okay. And that ended up getting, by a long process, getting picked up by a guy named Benito Mussolini, who had been a socialist and then went to the other end of the political spectrum and organized the fascist movement. Now, the groupist movement would be a fairly good, uh, it doesn't actually mean much, as you'll notice. <laughs> and so his was, his was the original fascist government. That's what he called it. And his fascist party um, proceeded to um, blunder its way around Italy for a while. They, you know, they, they did fairly well as long as Mussolini stayed away from military affairs, about which he knew absolutely nothing. Um, like so many dictators, he was, he was wrong about that. Or he thought he was a military genius. Hitler had that problem, too. Um, but the term got picked up more generally by the, by the political left in Europe between the wars because the, it, doesn't, it means so little. And so you could accuse anybody on the right of being a fascist and tar, the, tar him with being associated with Mussolini or with, as it was then thought, Mussolini's second-rate imitator in Germany, a guy named Hitler. Um, and after it was picked up that way, it was stretched. It was used in propaganda during the war, of course. And thereafter, um, it was during the war, I think, it was Aldous Huxley was saying, at this point, the word fascism means nothing but something of which one should disapprove. And in fact, many of the policies that were part of Mussolini's fascist party, his fascism, um, are standard these days. Things like um, you know, vacation programs for workers. That's fascist. That's fascist. Oh, that was one of the big programs that put Hitler into power, guaranteeing two weeks of a, a paid vacation for every worker. I think Germans take a lot more than two weeks now. These days they do, <laughs> but, that, but it was a, in 1933 that was radical. Right. But yeah, and so, but so what happens is at this point, the term fascism, if, if you want to give it any kind of real meaning, it has to do with political groups who want to imitate um, between the wars, fascist regimes such as Nazi Germany. And they, you know, authoritarian politics, glorification of the military, um, rejection of um, multiculturalism. There's a range of things like that. Some are very heavily into various racial notions. Some aren't. Mussolini's government wasn't particularly. Um, but so you have this, fring, this small fringe of people who are fixated on that sort of between the wars thing with the snazzy uniforms and the funny looking marching and the garish flags. And those are the fascists. And then you have a vast number of people for whom the word fascist means, you know, anything they hate. Right, it's a snarl word. It's a snarl word. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a, vo a verbal sound connected to um, in a, a, bunch of, a bunch of unpleasant emotions and that's all it is. So, as, as an accusation, it's pretty content-free. It's totally content-free. <laughs> it's very much like saying, you're an Oogie Boogie Man, you know? And these people are believers in Oogie Boogie Manism. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't have to mean anything. It just sounds bad. That it does. That it does. Back to the, uh, the Shooter Manifesto. The Shooter Manifesto. Which is described as eco-fascist in some way. I read it, uh -huh. and it was a puzzling document in that it seemed to be written by several different people. That would not surprise me at all. Yeah, it, it switched back and forth between, um, you know, say grade level in uh -huh. terms of the sophistication of the writing, and there were just clearly different voices mm -hmm. in it. Okay. And at the same time, it also seemed like a really clumsy sort of cut and paste pastiche. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you make of that? I, it wouldn't surprise me at all. It's entirely possible that some, some of the folks on 4chan mm -hmm. put it together for the lulls. <laughs> they just decided to run something and see if the media would buy it. It could have had some other source. It could have been the guy in question. He could have pasted something together. I want to see some evidence of who, who generated and where it came from. That I know of, correct me if I'm wrong here, we haven't yet had any interrogation reports from the shooter, who is, after all, still alive, and presumably will be facing trial, well, unless they put him in the same prison that Jeffrey Epstein was in. <laughs> <clears throat> So what we're talking about in a roundabout way right here is um, social control uh -huh. and control of the public narrative. Mm -hmm. People in positions of authority within the corporate media have the ability to lay down particular talking points mm -hmm. and people on camera will follow directions and, mm -hmm. and talk. 
in the way that they've been instructed to, but that doesn't really, it doesn't govern how you know, people talk to each other online because no, particularly doesn't. young people don't watch much television. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is some control, or at least that's what I got from your, uh, your recent blog post, your most recent one. Mm -hmm. uh, there is an attempt to control online speech as well. Well, the, the basically, every, everybody's trying to control the public narrative, and this goes back to the to the invention of public narratives. We're doing it right here. We're doing it right. We here. have an agenda. We're attempting. We're on camera in exactly. a studio. We're attempting to shape the public discourse. Right. And but, but we're we're doing it openly. But it's, exactly the thing is, it's one, and that's what call, what opinion pieces are about. Mm -hmm. You know, but do you remember back in those distant days when? Opinions went into the editorials and the news <laughs> gave, do, gave the news. That, I know, that's a very ancient, naive time. And advertising was separate from content. And advertising was separate from content. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, we actually had some really good news media in those days. Pity we don't anymore. One of the things I point to, though, is that many of the, of the, the legacy news media at this point are losing subscribers, they're losing viewers. Um, a lot of the big corporate media people are just not tuning into them, and it's not just that young people are interested. A lot of people are just disgusted by the constant manipulation and the constant reiteration of the same, often very dubious, talking points. I referenced the Jeffrey Epstein thing. Um, there was a recent poll by one of the big polling types saying that only about a third of Americans believe the official report that, that Epstein committed suicide. I remember the first reports I heard about it. My only contact with the mainstream media is national public radio. Gotcha. And on the first day that they were talking about Epstein's suicide. What a, uh, we'll just say death. Yes, his death in, in custody. Uh -huh. the, the stories were all premised around the idea that it was an actual suicide, uh -huh. and it was immediately trying to head off any, uh -huh. any questioning of that narrative, and, and basically casting anybody who would suggest that it wasn't a suicide as some fringe lunatic online, uh -huh. you know, propagating conspiracy theories. And, and that, that approach right there guaranteed, in a, at a time when the media really has lost the confidence of the American people, that guaranteed that there would be a hundred godzillion conspiracy theories, three, Two, one. There go. they are. Exactly. Yeah. Um, one of but, the, one of the things. But you know, two days ahead. later, uh -huh. they were describing it as an alleged suicide. Uh -huh. It's like that was a trial balloon they offered up at first, and it, it didn't work. It got it got <laughs> shot full of holes real fast. Right. But they're still they're still pushing the narrative, of course. Now, I don't know what happened to Jeffrey Epstein. You don't know. Yeah. Um, prob nobody outside of a fairly large, a fairly small number of people, rather. At, um, the, at the prison in question, actually knows what happened there. And whether we will ever know is a really interesting question. Given what he was facing, uh -huh. it's not hard for me to believe that he would want to commit suicide. The improbable part is that he would be allowed to. Exactly. <laughs> and that, he would, that having attempted suicide, he would be taken off suicide watch. And, you know, dot, dot, dot. There's a lot of stuff like that. But it's just... the. The thing that is of interest to me there is not what happened to Jeffrey Epstein, okay? Um, the thing that interests me is that so few people believe the official narrative, the narrative that, that is backed up now by the medical examiner's report. Most Americans had the immediate response of either that's complete crap or, well, we don't know what happened. That's the official story, but we don't know. And so watching that collapse of legitimacy on the part of the media, you're watching the, the, the working out of something that's been in process for decades, of course, but it's something that has very, very significant political implications. You know, there's a technical term for a narrative which is not expected to be believed, but which is expected to not be questioned. Mm -hmm. That term is bullshit. <laughs> I don't remember the author's name, but there's a book on uh -huh. bullshit, and that's, uh -huh. that's the definition. Um, I, I was unaware of that. That's, that's very useful. Okay. I'm glad it, that somebody has established a proper scientific definition for that term. <laughs> so Donald Trump uh, is a master of bullshit. Oh, he good. says things all the time, which nobody believes, and he can't realistically expect anybody to believe it, but he is the president of the United States, mm -hmm. and if you, you know, if you question him openly, uh, bad things will happen. You won't necessarily end up, you know, in cement overshoes, but no. uh, you might not be invited back to the, the White House press briefings. Mm -hmm. uh, Trump, is, Trump is a genius at getting his opponents to go into a Donald Duck frenzy. He does it deliberately. He does Can you it do an impression of the Donald Duck? <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
he, he, I forget who it was that suggested that basically for Donald Trump, Twitter is a laser pointer. <laughs> and the Democrats are cats. And he consistently, when he's been trying to push something through, he'll start a fury of furor going about something else and get everyone screaming and arguing about this other thing. The, the most recent example, of course, is the, the, the claim that he wants to use nuclear bombs to divert hurricanes. <laughs> That's an old one. That's an old one, yeah, yeah exactly. He... But it's great. Because it has, everyone's talking about how stupid Donald Trump is, and they're yelling about this year, they're yelling about that. Meanwhile, he's busy negotiating trade agreements. And we, and whatever, and probably getting somebody ready. Um, well, I think, I believe there's a name already in circulation, but getting things ready to deal with um, the probably imminent death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the struggle for who gets appointed to her place in the Supreme Court. So, he can keep them running after nuclear bombs and hurricanes. After, uh, you know, we may get another round of covfefe. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know, the term covfefe might be a very good word to introduce as, um, as, a labor, as a label for that kind of laser pointer behavior. Okay. Yeah, he's generating some covfefe to, to cover his tracks and get people talking about something else. Donald Trump is a very entertaining topic, mm -hmm. and I'm afraid he's a bit of a distraction in this conversation. That's fine. We have a, a two-word phrase that we need to confront right now. Go ahead. And that, that phrase is conspiracy theory. Uh -huh. uh, we're talking about power centers yes. in, our, in our society, uh -huh. uh, competing power centers. Of course. Some of them, their influence is mm -hmm. in the public discourse and their mm -hmm. control over it. Uh, what would you say to the inevitable charge that you're propagating a conspiracy, conspiracy theory? theory? Yeah, well, of course, I get that charge now and again. The, the crucial thing to remember is, first of all, conspiracies happen, mm -hmm. okay? Historically speaking, you can document. I wrote an encyclopedia of conspiracies, and I had no shortage of material. There have been a lot of conspiracies down through the years. When conspiracy goes, when, when researching conspiracies goes into conspiracy theory is when you start assuming that everything is a conspiracy, or that there's one conspiracy that controls everything. Because the world of conspiracy, the world of actual conspiracy, is a world of different power centers, different groups of people who are trying to push the narrative this way or that way. Um, I mean, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are technically speaking conspiracies. They're doing things to push the narrative one way or another, and they're not necessarily talking in public about what they're doing. That makes it a conspiracy, right? They're planning something in secret to try to shape public opinion. You know? um, there are people who go way overboard. <laughs> Not merely way overboard, but then to the bottom of the ocean, um, for whom everything is a conspiracy, everything is one great conspiracy, and you know, the, 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 the hidden grand pangendrum of something or other in his, in his mountain fastness somewhere is pulling all the strings. And at that point, you're not even talking conspiracy theory. You're arguably talking um, clinical paranoia. Yeah. But going to the opposite extreme and saying there are no conspiracies at all, nothing is ever decided in secret, nobody ever sets out to manipulate the public discourse for their own benefit, come on. As usual, the opposite of one bad idea is another bad idea. <laughs> I've heard tell that the phrase conspiracy theory was concocted by the CIA mm -hmm. and deliberately propagated in order to discredit mm -hmm. critics of government. Exactly. <laughs> that to say it was the product of conspiracy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But the thing is, it is useful to have a label that says, okay, take a look at this and make sure the person is not foaming at the mouth. Because the fact that there are some conspiracies does not mean that everything is a conspiracy, and it certainly does not mean that every claim of conspiracy is true. Is there a general rule of thumb that lets you know when you've passed the point of uh, sane consideration of possible conspiracies um, and into lunatic land? The well, there are several. Mm -hmm. The first, is already suggested, as I have already suggested, is that um, if everything is one big conspiracy, somebody's gone cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Okay. Um, if generally, if you start seeing too much of a unified field theory of conspiracy, if the people who allegedly assassinated JFK were also responsible for covering up the UFO land, the supposed UFO crash at Roswell, 
okay, then you're probably in la-la land. You know, and any time Bigfoot comes in, just back away. <laughs> um, How about aliens? Aliens, yeah, you, the thing is, there are, alien, there are plenty of alien conspiracy theories. Most of them come out of bad science fiction. Mm -hmm. um, Most? Yeah, the others, the others were generated by the U.S. Air Force. I've, one, of, one of my books, um, The UFO Phenomenon, talks about the way the Air Force has manipulated the UFO phenomenon since its beginning to cover you know, flight tests of things like the U-2, the SR-71, the early stealth planes, and so on. So that did not come out of science fiction. That came out of the bright brains of someone in the Air Force Office of Special Intelligence. Yeah, UFO sightings are uh, thick in the American Southwest, which just happens to be where the military develops the close, new aircraft. <laughs> the closer you get to um, Area 51, the, mm -hmm. the, te the big test range there in Nevada, or to Albuquerque, where Sandia Labs is located and various things, the more UFO sightings you get. And, and technically speaking, it's true. It's an object that's flying, and it's unidentified. That doesn't mean it's from, you know, Zeta Reticuli. <laughs> And, of course, the Air Force has had um, a certain amount of, has gained a certain amount of benefit from making sure that people think it's from Zeta Reticuli so they don't pay attention to those black triangular objects flying, you know, in the early days of the stealth program. So, like Donald Trump, just talk of aliens is very entertaining. It's and very entertaining. Maybe and distractingly it, and so. And it could, it could lead us. But, but the thing <laughs> is, all of this is relevant because... We're talking about mechanisms of distraction, mm -hmm. okay? And whether you're distracting people from um, discussing Trump's current ventures in trade policy by um, talking about, about nuking hurricanes, or whether you're distracting attention from stealth flights by talking about aliens from Zeta Reticuli, or whether you're distracting attention from the behavior of um, celebrity environmentalists by talking about eco-fascism. It's all the same mechanism. And it's a normal mechanism of political discourse. It's been going on for a very long time. Probably since about the invention of politics, which I think probably happened among baboons about six million years ago. You have a blog. You have a, I have a blog. dedicated readership. Lots of people comment on your blog. I, 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 get, I get about 150,000 readers a month. And uh, you carefully cultivate the comments section oh, yeah. of your blog. Talk about that. Oh, that's just... Too many people treat the comments section, first of all, as a place to allow people to yell at each other. Mm -hmm. Or as a place where only fawning is allowed. Again, the opposite of one, um, you know, one bad idea is another bad idea. I decided very early on in the first stages of my blog, when I was getting like five or six comments per post to actually engage people in conversation. And I also um, imposed a, a courtesy rule, okay? You have to be polite. There are certain things we do not permit here. Profanity is not permitted on my blog. You know, I want, I want people to talk in, in, in interesting fashion. There's nothing more boring than swear words. And so it's sort of grown from there, but it's turned into quite the interesting place for discussion, not debate. We have lots of venues for debate. We have very few places where people can just sit down and talk. And doubtless somebody will claim that that makes me an eco-fascist or um, a nuke aimed at a um, hurricane or something like that. But, but that's what we do. Well, you've mentioned that you get people posting people oh, posting. I'm, I'm sure there are actual human <laughs> beings. I, okay. I have not yet encountered anything that I think was actually generated by a computer. Okay. And th I, that I know of the aliens from Zeta Reticuli are not, are not responding to my blog at this point. Notice you're being very specific with your alien reference there. Oh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm working on a revision of my UFO book at this point. So aliens from Zeta Reticuli are kind of on, the, on my brain right now. So you get comments that supposedly come from different people, mm -hmm. but they have remarkably similar tone, talking points, structure, strategy. They, they have, it's typically running through a list. They'll start with a faux friendly, you know, I'm really supportive of what you're doing and this is really great that you're bringing up this subject, but here's this thing I really think is, a, is bad and it's going to make you look bad. And then they trot off the talking points. Uh, most recently, um, I, what was it, a um, couple of posts ago, I, I said something mildly unimpressed by Greta Thunberg, or about Greta Thunberg. And I got like three identical comments 
from different people with different IP addresses, as I check, all saying, you know, well, I'm really supportive of your blog and what you're doing is wonderful, but don't you feel you're being unfair to Greta Thunberg and running through a set of standard talking points about how important she is and blah, blah, blah. I found this suspicious. And this, this could be an emergent property of groupthink. It could. Or it, but could, be. It, or it could be a troll farm. <laughs> uh huh. Okay. How do you determine um, which one it is? Good question. All I know is that if I'm getting stuff that looks like it comes out of a can, it goes straight into the, into, you know, the deletion bin. My running joke is that I have a black hole named Spot. And anything that, um, that looks, anything that violates the, my, my rules of discourse or that looks like it's too obviously out of a troll farm go, gets fed to Spot. Now, the word troll farm sounds strange. There should be another word that goes in front of it. Usually I hear Russian troll farm. I, as far as I know, I have not encountered anything from a Russian troll farm. Mm -hmm. I have had things from um, liberal American troll farms from conservative American troll farms. You named one by, by name, something oh, blue. Oh, uh, ShareBlue. What is that? Um, ShareBlue is a, it's a um, democratic media organization that runs a troll farm. Okay. The quote, but it, it's above board. Uh, I mean, it, it admits its existence. Um, ShareBlue, yeah, yeah, you can find their website. Okay. Um, I don't know how much they talk about their trolling activity, but as with so many such things that, are run, that have volunteers involved, um, there are plants from the other side inside them, and so their talking points get a certain amount of distribution. Now, the same is true on the other side. I don't want anyone to think that I'm saying that there's something uniquely left-wing about troll farms. There isn't. Everybody uses them. Every presidential candidate has their own troll farm these days. I, I have a friend of a friend who, who worked for Barack Obama in two elections in that role, basically out there going through all the social media, um, planting Barack Obama talking points. And they were constantly contending with um, the uh, you know, the other side, which was busy doing exactly the same thing. That's normal. Anytime you criticize the behavior of the Chinese government, you're going to get a couple of very nice, well-spoken people who talk the official party line of, you know, what the PRC is saying about, say, Hong Kong. I've got one of those that tries posting fairly often. And it's some, you know, if it's polite and relevant, I put it through. And generally speaking, I, if it's polite and relevant, it isn't too obviously plastic. I'll put these things through once. I have somebody who comments on my videos regularly, and their image is of Xi Jinping. Mm -hmm. And the name of the account is Unelected Leader. <laughs> but this person is always speaking very highly of China. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it's, it's an odd name to go, I mean, yeah, given their, no, their the, agenda. <laughs> OK, there is, there is a. There's an acronym that's used on the leftward end of things, and it, I'm sure it has equivalents on the right and elsewhere, ROLCON, role-playing conservatives, okay? It is standard practice in troll farms to pretend to be of the opposite political mm -hmm. and then talk from that basis. And again, that's universal. Right, and then you say outrageous things that make the other no, side look no, bad. No, 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 ah. no. You're, you're trying to help the others. You're trying to help them get out their message. Like, like the, the Greta Thunberg thing, you know, this is, this is not going to be going to help you. This is really sounding bad. I had one um, with this most recent post because I'd mentioned the troll farm stuff saying, you got to realize that saying that about troll farm just makes you look paranoid. No, it doesn't. It makes me look realistic. But, but it's, no, it's always, well, very often, very often it's in a helpful, calm, maybe just a bit condescending tone. Mm -hmm. Because confrontation doesn't work. And, you know, what, in that kind of context, it doesn't work at all. You do not make people agree with you by yelling at them. Right. They harden in their positions. Exactly. You, you, make, you get people to agree with you by trying to help them and trying to, trying to hone their arguments and things like that. So. so we're talking about attempts at behavioral control, but even more at fundamentally uh, thought control. I would, say, I would say behavioral manipulation mm -hmm. and narrative manipulation. Nobody okay. has control. So narrative manipulation is something that uh, various power centers engage in. And always have. And always have. But our, our society right now, when I think about the various power centers, I think of you know, the fossil fuel industry. Mm -hmm. That's a huge one. Um, mm -hmm. The Democrats and the Republicans are 
two very similar sorts of organizations. They, they, com they compete with each other, and I believe you know, that they feel the competition. They feel the anger, but really, their interests are very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's also you know, what I would call Silicon Valley, which now has spread into China. Mm -hmm. So we get uh, you know, the bat in China, uh, what is it? Uh, Alibaba, Tencent, and Baidu are the big companies there. And they, they actually share some interests with Silicon Valley, even though they're in competition with mm -hmm. one another. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some other power centers that I'm not thinking of here? Um, really relevant ones. Relevant to what? Oh, well, the big, big players, I should say. Big, that's, it's difficult to say because one of the things to keep in mind is that, the, for example, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, you've got the party organizations but each one serves as a sort of meeting ground for a whole series of different power centers that are playing one way or another. And exactly who's doing what? For example, you've got the fossil fuel industry, which tends to be more supportive. Well, I should say the coal end of it tends to be very Republican. The natural gas end of it, uh, maybe a little more bi bipartisan. They're, they're working with both. You have mining interests who have certain agendas. You have um, the big, big agriculture, the big agricultural, and they have specific interests that they're pushing. Um, you have, of course, the medical and pharmaceutical industries desperately trying to get another round of the, uh, of the public feed trough, and so on. So the public conversation is not necessarily an end unto itself. It's more like a medium in which exactly. competition takes place. Whose interests are being served by propagating this eco-fascist narrative and whose interests are being uh, diminished by it. Okay, um, whose interests are being served, that's partly we'll have to see. Mm -hmm. You know, what we know is that this narrative is being widely publicized in the mainstream media uh, on, a very, on a very large scale with what looks like a set of bullet points behind it, okay? So clearly somebody has an agenda. What's the agenda? It's early days yet. They would be stupid to be too obvious, although it's possible they're being stupid. Um, clearly, it is to the advantage of the celebrity, um, the celebrity environmentalists, or the celebrities who have made environmentalism one of their one of their modes of virtue signaling, which is really what we're talking about here. Because you know, if you're actually an environmentalist, no, you don't have that kind of carbon footprint. If you have that kind of carbon footprint, you don't actually care about the environment. But you know, you have a lot of very influential people, very wealthy people who are finding themselves increasingly called on the carpet by the public and by the less sympathetic media who are saying, okay, why should we, th why, why should we accept your claims that you care about the environment? Look at your carbon footprint. Look at your broader environmental footprint because the flattening out of environmental damage to the narrow def definition of carbon footprint, that's a complex issue in and of itself. But is it just them? Is there something else going on here? I don't know. There are a lot of people who are pushing toward what sometimes is sometimes called bright green environmentalism. Which is what? Which, well, the, the bright green environmentalism is techno fixes. Mm -hmm. You know, we can still, we can use as much energy and go through as much resources and it doesn't matter because technology will fix it all. The, the geoengineering types are very into that. But there's a, there, there's a whole range of these things. And they, you know, clearly they and some of the corporations which stand to make billions of dollars off of geoengineering projects, for example, um, they would have a lot to lose if things like conservation became as important as they arguably should be. So if you want to make a fortune you know, getting on the government gravy train with your geoengineering schemes, uh -huh. you probably are not a friend of the eco-fascist narrative. Um, well, no, you can use the eco-fascist narrative because you can use that to, if anyone objects to your geoengineering project, mm -hmm. they're eco-fascists. If anyone suggests that maybe we should cut back instead, maybe we should use a less, less absurdly extravagant amounts of resources and so on, you're probably an eco-fascist. Okay. So it becomes a nice way to maintain the gravy train while sidelining potential critics. And so much of this, one of the things to keep in mind, and one of the things that often gets lost in conspiracy talk, is the idea that conspiracies are global, both global in the sense of planetary, but global in the sense of they relate to everything. In a situation of media manipulation, for example, it's typically um, you know, a very specific goal or set of goals that are being pursued. 
For example, getting a politician elected or whatever's being supported by the Greta Thunberg narrative um, or what have you, you know. You have these specific goals that specific troll farms will try to push, you know, the, the current interests of the, of the government of China. And so exactly what's going on with the eco-fascism narrative is a really interesting question. I have my speculations. Again, we'll see if I'm right. Would you share your speculations? Well, I've just said, I think, I think that it's, this is all in the service of an attempt to back away from, um, for celebrity environmentalists to back away from environmentalism and look for other forms of virtue signaling. I think it's a way to try to undercut attempts to avoid the sort of geoengineering, bright green end of, end of environmentalism, uh, to avoid any movement toward conservation. Um, toward um, you know lifestyle change and things like that, and but we'll see. So we are approaching the end of our conversation, mm -hmm. and um, we've been holding back, or at least I, I've been holding us back from the really entertaining topics. Let's talk about Donald Trump for a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> the most entertaining president <laughs> of my lifetime. Well, I've heard him described as the uh, the first troll president. Um, yeah, he is, he is really the first truly modern figure in, in our political discourse, the first one to actually make use of the Internet to its full extent as a place for trolling, as a place for shitposting, as a place for uh, Twitter storms and all the other stuff that he does. Um, all the things that enormous numbers of people do on a daily basis. I mean, he's not precise. He's not sending out pictures of his manhood, <laughs> but I, I'm sure that will happen in due time. Um, he's he's an, he's an incredibly modern figure. So when he first got into office, and uh, he could send the the corporate media into a, a tizzy with a tweet, I thought that pretty soon they would catch on to that obvious provocation. It's, it's amazing that they haven't. It's a, he just keeps on doing it, and they keep on falling for it. But it seems to me now that, from the perspective of the corporate media, there's no advantage to be gained by actually catching on or acting as if they understand what he's doing. I, I don't know. You'd... It's so entertaining to the, to the no, public to no, just it's... broadcast that indignation. Oh, my God, <laughs> can you believe what he tweeted? Yes, but have you noticed the ones that are, doing, that are being the most indignant? The media outlets are losing viewership at an impressive rate. Um, I forget who um, the exact numbers, but um, CNN's news programs, they, they've been way up there in what the right calls Trump uh, derangement syndrome. Um, they now have a viewership lower than the home renovation channel. <laughs> they've been shedding view viewers at an astonishing rate. MSNBC, uh, Rachel Maddow, mm -hmm. not doing much better. They're losing people at, a, at, a, at an amazing rate because ultimately, Outrage becomes boring after the first two years. And all you have is outrage. You know? Now, the people who are actually getting outraged, uh -huh. they're not bored. Because that outrage feels great. Yeah, but there seem, to be, there seem to be a little fewer of them with every round. It's hard to say. Because um, we each have a very selective window onto that, oh, whole, that big conversation. I'm watching, I'm watching here polls. Mm -hmm. I'm watching viewerships of the most anti-Trump media and various other bits of numbers here and there. And it looks as though, yeah, you know, certainly there are people who, you know, who get up in the morning and turn on the television so they can get outraged at Donald Trump. And that's what they do all day. And stoke that high. And stoke that high, exactly. Yep. Oh, it's, it's an adrenaline rush, no question. Um, Self-righteousness. You know, talk, you know your, your religious people used to talk about that quite a bit. It's, it's a rush. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, you have somebody you can feel better than. And Donald, that, that's one of the services Donald Trump really provides. I've occasionally wondered if the Democrats will basically throw the election because they have someone they can hate. You, you know, hate is not something you're supposed to do. Right. You know, hate speech is the worst kind of speech. A hate group is the worst kind of group. And with any kind of um, attempt and censorship of emotions like that, it's like the Victorians and sex. What's the result? Everybody wants to do it, <laughs> okay? So people want to hate. They want to have that, that rush of actually getting out there and hating somebody, and Donald Trump provides that. Mm -hmm. If he's driven from public life at the end of the, in the 2020 election, who are they going to hate? So 
I have suspected, I, I don't know, we'll see what happens, but it has occurred to me more than once that one of the reasons the Democratic Party is fielding such a collection of losers for this, for this, um, the 2020 campaign may be that they subconsciously want to lose. So yeah. they'll have four more years of blissful hatred and rage. I don't know, we'll see. Last question. Last question. Last question. Donald Trump mm -hmm. says, or said at one point anyway, that the whole notion of climate change is a hoax propagated by the Chinese. Uh -huh. So it seems like he is completely immune to the charge of eco-fascism, because yeah. he doesn't have an ecological bone in his body. As far as anyone can tell, <laughs> no, he doesn't. Um, so the, and it's going to be interesting to see how that works out. Um, because, yeah, you know, you can't claim, you can't call him an eco-fascist. You can call him a fascist, and people do, although if, you know, that's, it's inaccurate. There are many other kinds of, you know, authoritarian blowhard in the world that don't, you know, wear armbands and things like that. John Michael Greer, it is always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you.